Hello. Good. So we're starting again. Um, um, yeah. Uh, our next speaker uh, is Nick Spooner. Uh, Nick has done some really, really spectacular work in uh, in, in post quantum zero knowledge and. Uh, yeah, just to mention a few, he was one of the inventor of interactive Oracle proofs. Um, and uh, today he's going to talk about uh, post-quantum cryptographic proof system. Uh, very exciting topic. Nick, take it away. Great. Uh, thanks, Julia. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to be talking about, about uh, the post-quantum cryptographic proof systems um, and uh, sort of the, the challenges, the issues that come up when we, when we try and uh, study this, uh, these objects um, so sort of, uh, you know, cl taking classical cryptographic proof systems and we try and study them in the, in the, in the post-quantum setting, the security against quantum adversaries. Um, so let's start with sort of a, like a template of what we're, what we're looking at. Um, so uh, we have an interactive protocol. Um, there is a prover and a verifier, and the prover is trying to convince the verifier that some input X is in some language, okay? So this is like the standard sort of interactive setting. Um, and uh, the way that they do that is that they talk to each other, right? So they, uh, they interact over some number of rounds, the prover sends some messages, the ver verifier sends back some challenges, and then at the end, the verifier outputs some decision bit. So he's going to you know, say, say one if he thinks that indeed x is in L and zero others. Um, and you may be sort of familiar with the notion of an interactive proof, um, which is sort of looks, looks exactly like this, um, is like a sort of notion from complexity theory, and it has these two properties, right? It's the natural sort of completeness and soundness. So if X is in L, uh, then you can in, indeed convince the verifier that this is true, with, say with probability one. Um, and if X is not in L, then like the, it is not possible. So like no, no matter what you do, no matter what this prover does, uh, he, he cannot convince the verifier that X is in L. He cannot make, make the verifier output one with probability greater than S, where S is some, some soundness parameter. Um, so this is sort of the, the complexity theoretic like standard setting of interactive proof systems. Um, on the cryptographic side, uh, we have this, this uh, sort of uh, other notion, which is uh, maybe technically incomparable, but uh, that, that um, we call interactive arguments. Um, and basically what interactive arguments are is you, you sort of plug in the word efficient into both of these definitions. So the sort of the honest prover that does the convincing should be efficient, maybe given a witness for, the, for, the, for, uh, for X. Um, and uh, more importantly, in the soundness case, we only have to defend against uh, efficient provers. So it might be the case that um, you know, there, there exist inefficient provers uh, that can convince the verify maybe even with probability one, but uh, we don't care about those. Only, like, we only care about defending against efficient provers. And this is, you know, is a reasonable model. It's like a sort of, a, you know, in the real world, you would not expect a prover to come along who is like unable to do sort of, uh, uh, say, like exponentially hard computations. Um, and why might you want to consider these things? Well, it turns out that interactive arguments are sort of uh, subject to, uh, like, you know, given some sort of reasonable complexity theoretic conjectures, they are more powerful than interactive proofs in, in some sense. So you can um, get, for example, succinct arguments for, for NP, which uh, you cannot do with, with proof systems. Um, you can get statistical zero knowledge. Uh, you can also, like these, these sort of classical protocols for BQP, these are also argument systems, so this, the security is based on the soundness, uh, on the hardness of WE, um, and we don't know how to do this in the, in the um, that at least in the single prover um, statistical soundness setting, like the interactive proof setting. Um, so this is sort of the motivation. Um, and uh, what I'm gonna be talking about today is like how do you actually prove this soundness property? Right? So that we have this sort of cryptographic soundness property, right? And uh, the way that you prove it is like quite different to the way that you prove soundness for an interactive proof system um, because of this component that is like a, like a uh, sort of efficiency property, right? So there is some, some, just gonna be some computational assumption um, that, that, you, um, that you end up reducing to. Um, and the way that we reduce to this uh, assumption is by a, this object which we call a reduction. Um, and the reduction is gonna take in a hard problem. So uh, like some instance of a hard problem, uh, like this is, so this is the, the same kind of thing that Zico was talking about, right? So you, you have, some, you have so, uh, some procedure that takes in a, uh, as input uh, like a hard problem. 
um, like uh, you know so something like a one-way function uh, or you know uh, like solving like finding the logarithm of an element in a, in a group or something or you know something like that factoring an integer um, and uh, what you do is you like take your prover right and you sort of plug it into the middle of this reduction right so like the the, the so you take this like malicious prover that is convincing you with good probability you plug it into the middle of this reduction and the reduction is going to output a solution um, and the guarantee is that if the prover convinces the verifier with you know good enough probability when x is not in the language then uh, the this reduction composed with this prover is going to solve the hard problem um, and since uh, the reduction composed of the prover is sort of efficient because I kind of, uh, the prover is efficient and then the reduction you know, is also efficient itself, um, then we get a contradiction um, because we, believe, we conjecture that the problem is hard to solve for efficient uh, procedures. Um, and by efficient in the classical setting, you know, we usually mean some sort of non-uniform classical uh, process of polynomial time. Um, okay, what about the quantum setting? Um, so Zvika sort of already alluded to this, right? So there are a couple of, there are two problems, the two like key problems in the, in the quantum setting. So, um, you know, firstly, we, we have this quantum prover. And so that means that like when we plug it into the reduction, it's gonna be uh, like the reduction itself is gonna be quantum, right? Like the, there's no way to sort of dequantumize the prover in order to, to do this proof. And so the reduction is at least gonna be a quantum algorithm. Which means that the hard problem in order to reach a contradiction needs to be hard for quantum algorithms, which means that we sort of have to cross out some of these uh, assumptions because they're, they're resolved by, by Shor's algorithms, so like that these, these problems are actually easy for quantum computers. But um, you know, we still have some things left, like we, you know, we, have, we believe in one-way functions that are post-quantum secure, we believe that LWE is, uh, is, is hard for quantum computers as well. Um, so you know, we, we're in reasonably good shape since, since the 90s or so, like we have cryptography that is, that is, we believe to be post quantum secure. Um, so the second problem, and the one that I'm gonna be talking about today, um, is that actually, you know, a, 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 a quantum algorithm is a different shape to a classical algorithm. Like, it just does not look like a classical algorithm, really, in, in many ways. Um, and so it's kind of like trying to put a round peg into a square hole. Right? Um, and uh, I've drawn this, this circle so that this does not fit in the hole, um, and this is the sort of the, um, subjects of my talk is like when can we, how can we come up with reductions which, which have round holes in them? Um, and uh, I'm gonna sort of briefly mention these two sort of main types of reduction. Um, so actually the Zika's reduction, uh, the type of the reductions that Zika was talking about are, um, I'm not gonna talk about them really, um, but I, I, so, so I'm gonna talk about like a, a simplified, uh, like a simpler case and a, maybe a more complicated case. Uh, so the simple case is this like straight line reduction. Okay, so what does the straight line reduction do? Well, the reduction is just gonna play the part of the verifier and he's gonna talk to the prover like once through, right? So he's just gonna like ask the prover questions and uh, it, like there's gonna, he, he's gonna like try and learn from the interaction with the prover um, some information uh, in order, to, uh, in order to, to resolve the hard problem. Um, and uh, you know this is actually like this is great for post quantum security because like you're talking to this object and you're like talking to it once and so you actually don't really care about what it is right like it, it's it's like it, so in the setting that Zvika was talking about you actually talk to this object like more than once and so it matters what it is but if you just talk to it once and you talk to it sort of straight through then you know it, it's just a black box and you run it once and like this is sort of like by definition, by the definition of being a successful adversary, like this should just work. And so it doesn't matter what it is. It could be a, a quantum computer, it could be Schrodinger's cat, like it, it doesn't matter, right? Um, and so this means that all of these reductions are automatically quantum compatible. The problem is that they are, they don't seem to be sort of sufficiently powerful to like prove like security for certain protocols that we, uh, that we like. Um, so uh, examples include sort of zero knowledge protocols, also succinct arguments for NP. Um, I should mention that if you want a succinct argument for P, then there is actually a straight line reduction that will give you that. Um, so that's pretty nice. Um, but mostly like these uh, types of reduction are quite limited in their power. Um, and so we have this other kind of reduction, which is the focus of today's talk, which is called a rewinding reduction. Um, and a rewinding reduction, basically what you do is you take your prover and you kind of split it into two bits. So you, you split it into two parts. 
Um, so there's sort of the first part, which is the say you know say the, the, there's two rounds of communication. There's the first part, which is the first round of communication, and then there is the second part, which is the second round of communication. Um, and the, what the reduction is going to do is it's going to like uh, communicate to uh, the first part of the prover, and then communicate to the second part of the prover. And the prover is going to you know it has, it has this state, so the first part of the prover like spits out its state that the second part of the prover accepts. Um, and you know, so far, so straight lines. So, what is the like interesting thing that happens here? Well, we make a couple more copies of this uh, this um, second part of the prover, um, including its internal state that it is sort of the residual state from running the first part of the prover, and we run it, you know, some number more times. Here, I have like three times in total, but you know, it, generally, we're going to run it for potentially many, many times. Um, and so classically, this is all fine because we can copy classi classical information arbitrarily. Um, but um, as a certain handsome movie star suggested, uh, it is not possible to do this with, with quantum information. Um, so this is where this, this problem is going to arise. Um, OK. So, so this is the, the, the so we're going to focus on this like, right-hand side. Um, and we're going to focus on this in a specific context. I should say, actually, that this rewinding problem also comes up um, in, uh, in other contexts. And uh, um, so Nahue is going to talk about, the, uh, talk about this problem in the context of, of zero knowledge um, a lot more. Um, for this talk, I am going to talk about um, a sort of very specific problem that is, um, that is quite central to uh, interactive arguments. Um, and it is the setting of commit and open protocols. Okay, so what is a commit and open protocol? Um, well, there is, a, it is sort of conceptually, it's three rounds, uh, three messages. So the prover is going to send a bunch of commitments, um, which uh, you can think about as being little safes that contain messages. Um, and these commitments are what we call computationally binding, uh, which means that it may be possible to open the safe to different messages, like you, you can sort of fashion different keys and, and potentially it is like information theoretically possible to open each safe to, to many different messages. But um, as a prover, is, so as, sorry, as a computationally bounded party, it is not possible to open the safe to more than one message. So like there is, if you're computationally bounded, then the, like there is a message in the safe, right? If you're not computationally bounded, then it, 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 there could be many messages in the safe. Um, that's what this means. Um, the verifier is going to respond with some subset of these messages, of, of, these, uh, of, of these indices, right? So there are L commitments. You respond, you respond with a subset of, the, of L. Um, and the prover is then going to uh, open that particular subset, um, assuming that uh, so, uh, he has some rules about which subset he'll open, but he will open, the, you know, in the honest case, he will open that particular subset. Um, and the verifier is going to accept if, firstly, he has this predicate in his head, and the predicate says for uh, you know the, this, uh, which, which will depend on the the, the input x. Um, so the predicate says, um, you know, I, I will accept on like this subset and uh, these messages if uh, if this predicate outputs one. Notice that the keys are the, the keys to the safes are not part of this predicate, so it's just the messages inside of the safes in which safes you opened. Um, and the uh, keys that you gave me were like are valid openings of the safes. Right. So you know, the, 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 this is sort of the, the two conditions for the verifier accepting. Um, so why do we care about this? Well, there's uh, like many nice things that you can do. I should just mention. I'll just mention two of them. So firstly, if I uh, if I make these commitments also hiding as well as binding, right? So they are um, you know they're, they're safes, and so you sort of shouldn't be able to look inside of them. Without the key, um, then you can get uh, very, you can sort of easily get honest verifiers or knowledge protocols. Um, and uh, if you sort of uh, work somewhat harder, do a lot of complexity theory, then you can um, compose this with with uh, with PCPs, which are this powerful complexity theoretic primitive. Um, and uh, if you then sort of use a special kind of commitment. Um, then you can actually get a succinct argument. So this means a, a, an argument where the communication is, is much less uh, than the size of the computation that you're proving. Um, so this is a sort of very powerful building block. Um, and the soundless idea is, is kind of a simple thing, right? So we think about these 
these safes as being like commitments, right, as, as committing you to something. Um, and so we can define, you know, for, for like a fixed string, we can define what is the probability over this like choice of S, I should say, sorry, that, that S is chosen from some distribution. You can think about it as being uniformly random over some subsets of some size, doesn't really matter. Um, what is the probability that over this distribution that um, the predicate will be satisfied with its S? Right? Um, and then the, the way that you sort of approach this, this uh, sentence argument is you say, okay, for any fixed string, the probability uh, that this is, the, the, that you up a one um, is at most epsilon. Um, so like if the prover, instead of sending the commitments, just sent me the, the like MI in the clear, then this would actually be like an information theoretically sound protocol. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and so like what we're gonna, gonna try to do is reduce um, we're going to take sort of a, a prover for this real protocol and, and turn it into a prover for the um, for this sort of information theoretically sound protocol that we have like a, this this uh, sort of mathematical guarantee about. Um, so one example of this is, is three coloring, um, in, and so in the three coloring protocol, these uh, messages are like colorings of, of vertices, um, and uh, the sets are, are edges, and then you sort of choose and you choose an edge, and you see whether the colors are different. Right? This is a uh, this is a, a standard construction and it fits into this framework. Um, okay, so um, let's uh, have a look at the, the classical soundness. Um, so what, it's a rewinding type reduction, so what you do is you first, like you, you run the prover to produce these computationally binding commitments, um, and then he's gonna output, uh, and, then, uh, and then we run the, the, the sort of second part of the prover, um, and we're gonna get you know, some, some openings, and maybe they're correct, and maybe they're not correct, right? The prover can sort of behave arbitrarily. Um, but we know that they're correct with reasonable probability because the, we assume that the prover sort of is, is convincing us with, uh, with some probability S. Um, and then you know, we, we are going to kind of rewind or like clone the prover and, uh, and run another copy of uh, of this interaction, and maybe it says no, um, and then we keep doing this over and over again until we are satisfied that we sort of have enough of these openings. Um, and uh, once we've run it enough times, then what we do is we are gonna build up this string. Um, so what is the string? It's like a, the, the string, the, like these like MIs from the previous slide. So we're gonna build up the string by kind of, uh, you know, grafting together all of, these in, all of these interactions, right? So the prover is only gonna open some of the string. Um, in each time, but, but we're gonna run him many, many times and we're going to uh, sort of fill in parts of the string um, from each interaction. Um, and so, you know, we, we do this enough and eventually we'll have like a, pretty, uh, like a pretty full string. It might have some holes in it, but that's okay. Um, and uh, the, the, what we get, uh, basically by a channel found, um, is that, okay, firstly, like, there's a possibility that some, like, we're gonna try and fill in, like, an inconsistent entry in one of these, um, in one of these boxes, right? So it might be the case that, like, in different interactions, the prover just gave me, like, different things. Um, but if you do that, then actually you end up with an efficient uh, algorithm for breaking the commitment scheme, and so we, and we assume that this is impossible. Um, so, uh, so you know that that's sort of one case out of the way, and then once you um, once you remove that possibility, then uh, you can show basically by by a, by a channel found that the string that I get, the sort of the advantage of the string that I get, the the like uh, the value of the string is approximately the probability that this p tilde um, convinces the verifier in the actual game. Um, and so the big question for today is like, can an argument like this work when p tilde is a quantum computer, right? Um, and uh, this, this sort of structure is not going to work because it's sort of implicitly using cloning, um, but is there you know, something that we can do uh, when p tilde is quantum? Okay. Um, feel free to also interrupt me at any point if something is confusing. Um, okay. Um, okay. So to answer this question, we're gonna start by uh, thinking about you know, what does a quantum adversary look like? Um, so this is the, the, sort of the, this is the start of the sort of quantum-y part of this talk, like there's gonna be some, some Hilbert spaces and unitaries and things like that. Um, uh, so you know, if, you're, if that upsets you, I'm very sorry. Um, so the, uh, 
so the, we, we think about the prover as being, um, you know, again, this, this two-part thing. Um, and the first part is going to be some uh, quantum process that outputs classical commitments, right? So all, all of the, the prover's interaction is actually classical. Um, he's going to output classical commitments, and then uh, he has this sort of residual quantum state that is supposed to be in the real game, like passed to the, um, the next stage of him. Right, so we could sort of split him in half, and then we can think about his state after running the the first uh, after running the first round. This is going to be some mixed state. Um, okay, so uh, the in the uh, then there's sort of the second half of the prover. So you know this is just like a, just dividing the prover in half as as you would classically, um, and we're going to think of the second half of the prover in this like sort of specific way uh, that is very helpful. Um, so, in general, it's like an arbitrary quantum algorithm, but uh, I can take an efficient quantum algorithm and I can turn it into an algorithm of this form. Um, so, what I do is there, are, there is this internal register A, which, which is where this row is supposed to go if I run the, the prover all the way through. Um, and I'm going to apply a unitary to um, this register and uh, this register S, which is the input, the, the set that the verifier is interested in, um, and then some ancillar register. Um, so I apply a unitary, and then I apply a measurement in the computational basis to the, uh, the this ancillar register. So this is my like output register. And uh, any uh, quantum al algorithm, I, any sort of quantum circuit, I can transform into a circuit of this form, um, and this is going to be a sort of useful thing, useful way to think about quantum adversaries. So this is the, the, the model. Um, and I am going to, so before I sort of go into what we, uh, what we do with it, I'm going to introduce, um, oh, yes, go ahead. Yep. Sorry, are you assuming the proof row is in tensor product across those registers, or? The, sorry, what is the tensor product? The proof row? Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, you, you sent the commitment, right? Yes. And so you get this mixed state row? Yep. And so is that in tensor product with the other registers, or not necessarily? Uh, yeah, so I, I mean, I, so I have this, mi this mixed state row, and then these other two registers are like some classical registers that I just introduced. So yeah, they, they're going to be Oh, they're classical. Product. Yes. OK, yeah. I missed that. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, the ancilla is, uh, yeah, is, is, a, is a zero register. So the only thing sort of interesting register from a quantum perspective is this A, and everything else is yeah, trivial. Yeah. Um, um, so we're gonna. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna introduce like a, a couple of um, sort of important concepts which has to do with with this modeling question. Um, so you know we have this like we have this uh, sort of generic picture of this uh, quantum adversary, um, but I'm gonna modify it a little bit to make it easier to work with without sort of affecting its functionality really in any way. Um, so the first thing that we do is we change this measurement to be what we call a lazy measurement. Um, so uh, in a lazy measurement, what you do is you, you, you think, well, you know, it, it, in the case that the, the verifier doesn't actually accept the output of the, of the prover, then I don't really care what he says, right? I don't need this information. I'm just going to throw it away. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to measure first whether V accepts. So I measure a single bit. Um, and this, you know, there is a, a way to sort of formalize this, but basically I, I am measuring just the, the I, like I, I want to sort of collapse the superposition uh, into either like places where the verifier accepts or does not accept. Um, and only in the case where the verifier actually accepts, I'm going to measure um, the, the messages. Um, so notice here that I'm actually not measuring the keys, and this is, um, this is sort of important, but um, you can not think about this for this talk. Um, so what does that look like? Well, I have this like measure this binary measurement v, which uh, measures you know, which which outputs one if the verifier accepts on on this and and zero otherwise, and I apply this first, and then conditioned on this outcome, um, I'm going to measure the the message register, um, and then just for good measure, I'm going to like put a u dagger on the end of this. So this is just uh, you know this is a in order to make this thing into a projective measurement, um, you want to put this u dagger. You can think about it as just like you, you like put the adversary back into a state that is uh, of the form, um, the, of a form that kind of makes sense for the beginning of the interaction. Um, 
Okay, so that's one thing. This is lazy measurement. So this this clearly does not change. Like if I if I have a prover that operates like this, it just it is as successful as it was before, right? Because in the case where the verifier says no, then um, you know I, I I I may as well like output nothing. Right? Um, so uh, the other thing I'm going to introduce um, is a is a sort of useful uh, now like a cryptographic notion. Um, so uh, let's call this the state at the end of this process row one. Um, I can define another state row two, which is, from, which is the result of a very similar process, except that I don't measure the message part, right? So I only measure the verifies decision bit. Um, and there is this property called collapsing, which is a property of actually the, the commitment scheme the, the, in the commit and open protocol, um, which says that these two states, if I don't know this, if I, like, uh, I'm not given the MI, so if I'm given the MI, then, then I can tell. Um, but if I'm not given the MI, then these two states at the end of these processes are indistinguishable from each other. So this measurement of these MI, of the, the, the messages, is uh, undetectable. Um, whereas, you know, in, in general, you know, you quantum uh, measurements are, are disturbing, and so, like, you, in general, you can detect whether a measurement has happened. What this says is that computationally, it is impossible to detect whether this measurement has happened. Um, and uh, so, what this will mean is that actually we can switch to the simpler case of thinking about this binary measurement, right? And uh, and we know that if we can sort of handle this binary measurement, then we can insert these um, these measurements uh, these measurements of the messages. Um, and it's not going to sort of mess with anything. So we can put them in, and like no one will notice, and so, so everything will be OK. We'll be able to get the messages. Um, and so it suffices to actually just think about this binary measurement. Um, and because this binary measurement is so important, I'm going to call it something. So this is called M, M sub P. Um, and it's a projective measurement uh, with, uh, with a 0, 1 outcome. So it has a, a, this, these two uh, elements. Pi P is the 1 outcome, and I minus pi P is the 0 outcome. Um, great. So given this setup, we can now like uh, write down sort of a schematic for what we think quantum rewinding might look like. Um, so what we're going to do, basically, we run, the, we run the first part of the prover first. Um, we get out the state. And then we're going to sort of run this MP over and over again, right? So for, for different choices of, of the set S, which are drawn from the distribution that the verifier uses, we're going to run this MP measurement over and over again. Um, and the aim is to obtain a one outcome for many different S's. Um, and the reason this is enough is because of this collapsing property. So once I have, I'm, I'm able to do this, I can sort of insert these measurements in the, the correct places, and I will get the actual answers. And this is not going to affect the rest of the, um, so the, rest of the rewinding because of the collapsing property. Um, so this is the sort of abstract problem, right? So we have this binary measurement, which, uh, you know, which is indexed by this S, and we want to get it to output one many, many times. Um, and actually, so this picture that I've drawn is already, it already gets you something. So it's, it's not clear that this would even, like, do anything non-trivial, but actually, if you start with a prover that convinces you with probability gamma, then the probability that the first k outcomes of this procedure are one, um, is like gamma to the 2k minus 1. So, you know, if, if k is small, then this is like a, you know, k is a constant, then this is a polynomial in gamma. And so this is like already something, um, you know, that you sort of get, get got for free just by sort of uh, manipulating the prover and then like thinking about this collapsing property. Um, unfortunately, this is not going to be enough for many cases. And even for cases where it is enough, it's kind of not, it doesn't really give you, it doesn't give you tight security because like the, you have this, like classically, um, you, the dependence on, on K should, should not be there. Um, and so you get like worse security in the quantum setting than in the classical setting. Um, and if K is sort of super constant, then this actually is, is not very useful at all. Um, so we're going to see how to uh, do better than this. And the way that you do better than this is by sort of putting things in between these, uh, these MP measurements, right? This is sort of uh, a reasonable thing to do. So there's going to be these two procedures, setup and repair. And setup is something that sort of pre-processes this, uh, this P1, uh, the state that comes out of P1 tilde, um, and, uh, and sets it up for the rest of the procedure. And then repair is going to sort of fix the state in between each uh, iteration of, of uh, MP. 
Um, and the guarantee that we're going to get is that uh, once, we, once we put in these repair things, uh, a gamma fraction of all of the trials are going to be successful, at least in expectation. And this will be enough for security reductions, most security reductions. Um, OK. Yes? Uh, so you mean like, the, yeah, so this is not part of the protocol of that. Makes yeah, exactly. So it's not part of the actual protocol one would run. It's just more for the security analysis. Exactly. Yeah. So it, it's it will. This this is a picture of like the reduction. Uh, so yeah, this is just for the security analysis. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks. Um, yes. Okay. Uh, so for the remainder of the talk, um, which I have, I think like twenty minutes or so, um, I'm gonna try and describe these algorithms at a um, you know a reasonably high level. Um, and uh, hopefully, um, you should get something out of the, sort of what these algorithms are and, um, and the guarantees that they give, um, and you'd be able to use them in your own research, maybe. Okay. Um, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is a technical tool, uh, which is called the Return to Subspace Lemma. Um, and uh, what this does, or what this tool is, is it's, it's a statement about what happens if you um, apply uh, if you apply alternating projective measurements. So I have some uh, state psi A, um, which I didn't write down, but is in the image of this pi A, which is the, the one element of this measurement MA. And I have this other measurement MB, and I'm going to alternate these two back and forth. So th this, is my, this is my procedure, and I'm just going to you know, run this for some amount of time. Um, and the returns associated measurement says, OK, think about the random variable that is like the first time that MA outputs one. Right, so if I, you know, if, I, if I measured MA at the beginning, then it would always output one, but I, I'm not going to do that. So I'm going to first apply MB, and then I'm going to you know, alternate these things. And I am looking at like, the first point at which this MA outputs one. Um, and once this happens, uh, by properties of projective measurement, I know that my state after that is in the image of this pi A. Okay. Um, and it turns out that the expected, num the expected number of iterations that this takes, so uh, like treating a treating iteration as like MB and then MA, is exactly one. Um, and why is that? Well, um, let's think about sort of the two-dimensional case, right? Like imagine that, that uh, the psi is just a qubit. Um, then you can draw these projectors out as these like uh, two um, uh, sort of right angles in this space. Um, that are like offset from each other, um, and so there is like this this uh, this psi a, but then there is also a state psi b, which is the the state in the direction of pi b in the subspace, right? And then the, these two orthogonal states, um, and there is some angle between the, these uh, the two axes, um, and uh, if you'd like look at the you know, squared cosine squared of this angle, then this is the inner product between these two things, and we're going to call this um, we're going to call this p. Um, and if you, like, if you know a little bit about quantum measurement, what you can see is that um, when, when I apply this MB, with probability P, I'm going to jump to this state uh, psi B. And with probability 1 minus P, I jump to the, the orthogonal state, this uh, psi B um, orthogonal. Um, and then when I apply MA, uh, I'm going to jump to either, either psi A or um, psi A perp depending on what happens. And the probability that I sort of go from psi b to psi a is p. Um, and symmetrically, the probability that I go from psi b perp to psi a perp is also p, because the angle is the same. Yeah. Um, and the probability that I switch is, is you know, just 1 minus p. And so I have this sort of procedure where I um, flip from, from like a, a one, uh, 1 to a 0, 0 to 1 with probability 1 minus p, and I stay, at one, uh, stay there with probability, with probability p. Um, and what you can sort of observe uh, is that, uh, okay, I mean, it's, it, maybe it's like not possible to observe it in a talk, but if you sort of sat down for a, a couple of minutes, you would be able to, to prove that actually uh, the expected time to sort of return to say A is, is one, and it is independent of P. And the reason is sort of like, think about what happens um, when say P is close to one, right? Then like you go to say B, and then you go to say A, because this is like the, you know, uh, because the, these both these probabilities have uh, have uh, like probability these, these transitions have probability close to one, and if p is close to zero, then you go to say b perp, but then you go to say a, right? so you you try to do this thing, 
And uh, in between, okay, like it's a bit more complicated, but, but these, uh, these sort of two um, phenomena are going to cancel out. Um, Okay, so this was two dimensions. What about higher dimensions? And this is another, so I mean, this is another very important lemma in, uh, uh, you know, probably more important than this one. Um, so this is uh, Jordan's lemma, which is due to Camus Jordan from the 1890s or something. Um, and what it says is basically that as far as two projectors are concerned, you only really need to think about two dimensional stuff. So when you have two projectors, you can decompose your space into two-dimensional invariants of spaces, so like that are invariant under both projectors, um, where these the projectors are rank one in each space. So they sort of project onto a single vector in each subspace. So what does that look like? Well, you have like all of these different subspaces, um, and uh, the projectors here are, are all rank one, and then you have these kind of different angles in, in each subspace, right? So the the, the vectors this theta from the, the previous slide, now you have like a theta for every subspace. Um, and so you sort of have these transition systems that happen inside of each subspace. Um, and the transition behavior is, the, is, is a global thing, right? Because like all of the subspaces are gonna to transition to, like the, the, the measurement outcome is like a global thing of all of the subspaces. Um, and so you can compute the probability of a particular measurement outcome uh, as sort of a weighted sum. So there is like some amplitude that lies in each subspace and uh, you can then like look at the, um, you sort of weight each subspace by its amplitude and then you look at the, the thetas to determine the, the transition probabilities. Um, and so once you have this uh, decomposition, it's not too hard to show that, that this percentage of base lemma extends also to higher dimensions. Okay. Um, all right, so now that we have this, uh, this lemma, um, I can describe sort of a sketch of this, uh, of this repair, of, of, this, um, uh, of this rewinding procedure. Um, so suppose that we had, for a moment, the efficient, an efficient projective measurement, um, so binary projective measurement, which projects onto states that are good, uh, in the sense that if I run the prover on this state, it's going to convince the verifier with probability at least gamma. Um, and for brevity, I'm going to call the quantity, um, like the, the sort of the probability that the prover run on the state convinces the verifier, I'm going to call this quantity omega of, of psi. Okay. So, um, so this is a projector that projects on, like, onto all states where omega of psi is at least gamma. Um, and for those of you in the audience who like, know about these things, please do not be alarmed, this is really not true. Like the, this, the, I will explain the, the many ways in which is not, this is not true, but let's like imagine for a moment that this is true. Um, okay, so let's say that we now we start in a, uh, we start with the state that is in, in this image, right? Um, then the first thing that we do in our, in, in our rewinding schematic is we measure this MP and we, you know, we get either a zero or a one and we get a one with probability at least gamma because uh, the state is in the image of pi gamma. Okay. Um, then what we're gonna do is we're going to um, apply this, this other measurement, this uh, m sub gamma, and let's say it up to zero. This means that we're not done because we are like, not in the image of pi gamma, right? so we're gonna keep going, um, and we're gonna apply this mp again uh, using the same s as before, so it's the same measurement. Um, and, uh, and then we apply m gamma again, let's say it's it, it output zero again, then we apply MP, again with the same S, um, and then we apply M gamma, and, and let's say this time it outputs one, and then we can stop, okay? So this looks a lot like this like return to subspace alternating measurements thing, and indeed it is exactly that. Um, and so, uh, uh, so the expected number of iterations is order one, right? Um, and, uh, and this blue box here is then going to be the repair procedure in the, in the quantum rewinding schematic. Uh, that's really, you know, how it works. Um, why does this work? Well, uh, you know, at the end, you have a state that's in the image of pi gamma, and by this, uh, you know, crazy assumption that I made, um, the, uh, uh, this means that when I measure this final state, you know, I, I will get something that is, um, uh, that, out, that outputs a one with probability at least gamma. And then I can keep going, right? Because now I'm sort of back in the original situation that I was in, like I had a state in Pi Gamma and then I disturbed it by this MP, and so I can keep, I can continue and I can do this as many times as I want. Um, okay, so in the end you end up with a gamma fraction of one outcomes. Okay, any questions about this um, template? No, okay, great. 
Okay, so like I said, this is really not true. And uh, one reason that it's not true is actually the set is not even a linear space. Like if you think about, you know, the set is actually defined in terms of this like quadratic form, and so it's just like not, not a linear space at all. Um, and so we actually can't even define this M sub gamma because there's no projector onto this space, right? Um, and, you know, we certainly can't efficiently realize it, right? Like, you know, I've just sort of made this thing up. Um, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna find like a good enough approximation to this M gamma that sort of has the properties that we need and is not exactly this M gamma, but it's, you know, it's all right. Um, and the way we're gonna do it is we're going to analyze this, uh, this quantity omega of, uh, of psi. So remember, this is the probability that you, um, so this, this, you cause this measurement to output one, output one for a random S. Um, and so just writing this out, uh, you know, in, in terms of the, um, uh, like, like just expanding this out, right? This is like the probability, the sum of S, uh, the probability of S uh, times the probability that um, this like pi P measurement on this particular S um, and psi like outputs one, which is this, this quantity, this, this norm, squared norm. Um, and it turns out that this is uh, sort of the, the expected value of um, some um, Hermitian matrix uh, H on, on this psi. So what is this emission matrix? Well, it looks like this. Um, it doesn't really, like, I, I wouldn't worry too much about precisely the definition of this emission matrix, but it's, it is emission, and what that means is that we can diagonalize it. Right? So that's what we do. Um, so it has this, the, this eigenbasis, um, these VJs. And then our projector, we're gonna say that it is the projection onto um, the eigenvectors uh, of this, this matrix H that have eigenvalue at least gamma. Okay. So this is a linear space, right? It is clearly, a, like I've, I've, I've written it down, and it's, it's clearly a projector. Um, why is it good enough? Um, so let's think about you know, the properties of this thing. So firstly, it satisfies sort of this, this one property that we, we, we really want, which is that like, if, if uh, you have a state that is in the image of this projector, then um, its value is at least gamma, right? Because uh, um, yeah, its value is at least gamma, um, because you know the way that we compute it is the way that we compute the value is by um, you know, putting this um, uh, gamma on uh, this the psi on, on the either side of H, and uh, if you sort of write everything out, then it is clear that this is at least gamma. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know the, these VJs they form a basis for the entire space, um, <clears throat> and so we can write out our state psi in this basis. Right, and then the value of the state um, is this like weighted sum of the corresponding PJ values. Okay, um, so what this looks like, you know, sort of pictorially, is that I can take my P, my, my P tilde, my, sorry, my, my prover P tilde, and uh, and the, its its internal state, and I can sort of split it up into a bunch of um, into a bunch of uh, uh, sort of eigenstates. Right, so these these are like the VJs. And each of them has a different amplitude. Um, and these sort of correspond to kind of like, uh, like the, these are kind of the basis for the prover, right? So, so these are like the actual, like the, the prover is like a, a superposition of these sort of basis provers. Um, and what we're gonna do is we're just gonna say, okay, like the, the measurement is I just, I just uh, measure whether um, the prover is like above or below this gamma. Um, and uh, basically by Markov, uh, actually, if I take any state that, you know, and if I take any state at all, then the probability that I get an outcome one for this uh, pi gamma measurement is at least the, um, like the value of the state minus gamma. Um, okay. So what does this mean for us? Um, well, this means that, um, so, okay, we have some, now some arbitrary state, right, rather than, rather than some eigenstate. Um, what we're gonna do is we're going to, like the setup algorithm is going to be like, uh, just run this M gamma measurement. And uh, okay, here I've, you notice that I've sneakily increased the probability that P tilde convinces V. Uh, so it's now two gamma rather than gamma, this is fine. Um, so the probability that this M gamma measurement outputs, um, outputs one is gonna be at least gamma by this Markov um, property from the previous slide, right? So this state rho is arbitrary, it's not like gonna be an eigenstate or anything, but like I, if I perform this, um, this uh, M gamma measurement, then I get a one with probability at least gamma. 
Uh, if I get a zero, then I should just stop because actually, you know, it might be that the state is, is useless now, right? It's, it's like maybe it's, it's collapsed to one of these like, um, you know, low probability, low success probability components. Um, and then the repair procedure is just going to be, oh, sorry, so, so after I do this, like if, if I get a one, then this thing is gonna be in the image of pi gamma. Um, and the repair procedure is just gonna be this uh, uh, alternating projectors. Um, so I do this many times. And that's basically it, right? This is the whole um, quantum rewinding algorithm. Um, up to, of course, one, one very um, small detail, which is I didn't tell, tell you how we implement M gamma. Yep. Uh, sorry, which, what is? Uh, gamma? Yes, uh, this is a good question. So it depends on the protocol. Um, so uh, it's gonna depend on sort of how, um, like you, you wanna say like I, I start with a, a prover that convinces my verifier with the probability at least gamma, right? And, and I want to get some contradiction. So it depends on the protocol um, in this, in the sort of cryptographic setting, it's often going to be some um, arbitrarily small inverse polynomial. Yeah. Um, but it also, this kind of thing will also work if gamma is, say, a constant. You can, you can, um, it sort of works for, for anything in this, yeah. And, and like any, any sort of uh, reasonable, like, you know, reasonably, um, yeah, any, any sort of reasonable gamma. So anything that's not too small, it will work for. Um, okay, I think I'm happy. Yeah. The, the, the runtime is going to depend on, on gamma. This is uh, you know, where, where this comes in. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, I guess in the, I have like two or three minutes? Two minutes, okay. Um, so I, I will sort of very briefly go through this. So basically we can't implement M gamma um, exactly. So there is instead this approximation, um, which is, uh, so you, you, there is this projected measurement um, which outputs B, and the probability that B equals one has this like funny um, guarantee. Basically, it's like not too far away from um, the actual value. Um, so this is like a sort of Markov type guarantee, um, and it turns out that this is this is enough for for the, the for what we need. Um, and it is uh, what we call almost projective, which means okay. So this is a projective measurement, but it's defined on on a, like an additional register. Uh, this initial ancilla register. And so if we run this twice in a row, um, we don't necessarily, like on, with fresh ancillas, we don't necessarily expect to get the same answer both times. Um, but this, this uh, measurement actually has the property that with very high probability you do. Um, okay, uh, and uh, I won't go through like why, but basically this M gamma tilde is like as good uh, as M gamma up to, you know, these, these small errors um, because the, what you can show is that the state in the middle, this phi, uh, if I get a one for the first m gamma, then um, it's going to, the state uh, phi is gonna have a good, um, is gonna have a good value. It's, its value is gonna be like gamma minus two, uh, minus, minus something very small. Um, and you can implement this thing using uh, sort of alternating projectors type techniques like following Mario Watrous, um, or using more fancy stuff is like QF, QSET algorithms. Um, Okay, so there is some issue of like the, of, of this ancilla because it's, uh, you know, now, now there's this ancilla and like the output of M gamma tilde only is only meaningful when the ancilla is one. It turns out that you can deal with that, but I don't really have time to, to talk about it. Um, so if you would like to know about how this works, then you can catch me afterwards. Uh, it's sort of a clever use of Jordan's lemma. Um, okay, so to wrap up. Um, interactive arguments are really great. Um, they have amazing properties, including succinctness and statistical zero knowledge, which we, which we don't know how to necessarily get, um, but whether we, we believe we can't get um, in the, in the non-computational setting. Um, but post-quantum soundness is really hard for these things because it's, uh, the, the security directions in the classical setting are based on rewinding arguments, and it seems to be somewhat inherent. Um, and what we saw is a method that rewinds a quantum adversary to obtain sort of arbitrarily many accepting responses. Um, and this is enough for these kinds of soundness arguments. It is not enough for you know, many other things, uh, as Nahue will, will talk about, but, but um, this sort of resolves uh, the soundness of, of these like, commit and open type protocols. Um, what's next? 
So uh, the other use of rewinding in cryptography, that is the other main use of rewinding in cryptography, is for zero knowledge simulation. Um, and there are some, you know, many interesting works about that, um, including a follow-up work of mine. Um, there, so, so what I talked about here was these commit and open protocols that have, um, you know, they have like one challenge round. Uh, you can also think about protocols that have many challenge rounds and how you rewind those. Um, and uh, in a work with Russell Lyon and Julio, we uh, address this for like certain types of these protocols. Um, so this is like lattice bulletproof protocols. Um, you can also use these techniques to get 16 arguments with quantum communication um, where, so, so uh, in the classical setting you need uh, collision resistant hash functions for these distinct arguments, say in the quantum setting, you, you, it turns out you don't. Um, uh, so what is open? Um, well, one, one big question is like parallel and concurrent zero knowledge and, and things like that, like protocol composition. So this is like very hairy even in the classical setting with rewinding and quantumly we just know nothing at all. Um, there is this uh, interesting, I, I wouldn't really be able to go into it, but there's this interesting over-extraction problem for something called extractable commitments that I would be happy to, to, to talk about with, with anybody who, like offline with anyone who wants to know about that. Um, and finally, there's a sort of an interesting question about, so the reduction that I presented really depends on being able to tell that you won in the game because you have to like measure this, like your own, you have to measure the proof of success probability. Um, and so this is, just doesn't work if the protocol is privately verifiable. Um, and so, you know, are the, I, like, I, I believe there is actually a real barrier here, um, but, um, um, you know, are there protocols where, which are privately verifiable where you can do this kind of um, reduction anyway? Um, okay, uh, and then finally, I wanna leave you with sort of this, this grand challenge, which is actually quite similar to what, to Zvika's grand challenge, except like specifically for, for the interactive setting rather than the non-interactive setting. Um, so like when can we lift these rewinding reductions? And it turns out the answer is like not always. Okay, so there are, there are protocols which like, you know, under cryptographic assumptions like cannot be rewound in the quantum setting and they actually give you um, these like uh, post-quantum, uh, sorry, proofs of quantumness from LWE. Um, and this like these rely on sort of the non-rewindability of, of, uh, of uh, quantum algorithms. Um, so this is the question I would like to leave you with and thank you very much. Thanks, Nick. There is a question from the chat. Maybe I can quickly. Yeah, read go ahead. Um, so Thomas says that interactive proof system are piece space complete in the classical settings. What is the complexity in your interactive quantum setting? Uh, it's also a piece space. Um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'm not sure, what's, what's the problem with privately verifiable protocols? I mean, all you need is the ability to test whether the state is good or not. So you can just start a new interaction. I guess you can, right? You, yeah, so I, I need to be able to run the verifier in order to tell whether I won, right? Yeah, like, so I, I need to, like the, this repair thing. So the problem is that you need to be consistent with like the transcript so far. Like, yeah, yeah, so like I, yes, so it, the, so the verifier may have some, some state that, you know, he is using to verify the transcript and like if, if I have access to the state, maybe the reduction doesn't go through anymore because the state has a trapdoor or something like that, right? This, um, but, but it doesn't have to be the same. All, all you're testing is that, right, all you need to verify is that the prover like responds to some, you know, arbitrary, like to a randomly generated challenge, right? It's uh, not like the challenge that, I see, I see, yes, um, this is true, this is true. So you, you are repairing with respect to a random challenge right. rather than the challenge that was made in yeah. the protocol. Um, but, uh, oh, but, but okay, but the, there are these two measurements that you alternate, right, and one of them is like, did I succeed on this challenge? And one of them is, do I succeed on a random challenge? And the, this one is like the, do I succeed on this challenge measurement? I can't realize if the... Right, but, but this, this one you have, this yeah. is with the actual, anyways, I'm saying, yeah. well, okay, I guess my intuition comes from the non direct in the non direct setting, you can do it, you can also think about privately verifiable, even right. in the challenge response, and there it works. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, so, but I guess here it's additional problem that you need to be sort of consistent with. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a, like, I, I, don't, I don't know how big an obstacle it is. I mean, you can't do it generally because we have privately verifiable protocols that can't be rewound, right? Um, they, they have like all of the features of rewindable protocols except that they are privately verifiable. And so this is like, there should be a, some sort of barrier. Um, so in particular, this, um, the, the, the proof of quantumness that you guys have, Right. Um, or the, the Mahada protocol, they are in fact collapsing, like they have collapsing mm -hmm. properties, but they are not rewindable because this would, you know, they, they would, they, this, this would break the, 
security guarantee. And so it must be that something goes wrong here. Right, okay, yeah, yeah. so the security key has to come from like the first, okay, thanks. Yeah, exactly, yeah, thanks. So we are, we are running a little late with time, so maybe we can take the rest of the questions offline. Uh, and let's thank Nick again. Thank you. Um, let's take a quick break and come back at 11.15 for the next talk. In the meantime, we can set things up. <laughs>